Practice and Play with Drew Fire. Hi, this is Keith Williams. Welcome to 5 Watt World, where we're interested in helping you get the most music from the least gear. The most music from the least gear. The definition of least is very different for each of us, depending on what it is we're doing with our gear. Running 5 Watt World presents a number of challenges for least gear. Come to find out, it takes quite a bit of gear to make these relatively simple videos. And because doing it with just enough has been something I've been wrestling with for years, it makes sense that folks are curious to know what gear I choose to use. And so, the long requested studio tour is here. If you enjoy the videos, take a minute to subscribe. If you've already subscribed, swing by the store to grab a t-shirt or a hoodie or the Stomp Precept Pack to support what we're doing here. And if you don't need another hoodie but want to become a bigger part of 5 Watt World, think about becoming a friend of 5 Watt. The links are in the description. The first step was choosing a new house to put it all in, and the first step in that was deciding where to live now. I needed a town with a cool music scene, and a bonus would be a great music store that I might be able to work with. I knew that in Syracuse there was a jazz festival, a blues festival, and an organization called Central New York Jazz that's been promoting jazz shows and music education for 30 years. And while I was researching the history of the PRS Custom 24, I found a guitar store that had a PRS from the first year of the factory. I hadn't heard of them before, Ish Guitars. I went and met with them right before the pandemic, and they were very cool. So that box was checked too. As many of you know, I grew up in a large family in upstate New York out in the country. After college, pursuing my career in higher education, I've always lived in college towns. Great coffee shops, better than average food scene, you know the feel. So I pulled out some maps and started triangulating. In the end, my needs added up to one hour from the family, so Syracuse was the obvious choice. Having found the right house, I now have two spaces set up for the channel. The room where I research and write scripts, do live streams and write music, and a space where I film the bigger, teleprompter-driven videos. Producing videos does take quite a bit of gear. Least gear does not always mean little gear, just the least amount to get the job done. I'd started the channel making videos in a loft, then moved to an even smaller loft at the house in Ithaca. Paul Davids took his channel to over a million subscribers in a room so small that many might classify it as a walk-in closet. So I knew I'd have a level of luxury here in this new place. At the new house, the smallest bedroom also had the best natural light, so that was the obvious choice for a space to spend the majority of my time. This room is 9 by 12. For years, I've used keyboard stands as the base for a desk. They're great because they allow you to adjust the height, and if you're also going to put keyboards in the room, everything matches. Over the years, folks have joked that I have a certain level of, shall we say, tidiness, to which I generally respond that I'm less tidy on the inside than I might be on the outside. I bought a piece of cherry butcher block from a hardware store and put a few coats of varnish on it for a top. I had to have an electrician come in to upgrade the grounding as the house was built in 1953, just before that was standard. I then used Furman Power Station 8 conditioners that go on the floor. This helps me avoid having a rack still, and I really didn't want to add a rack unit to take up floor space. I have three of them in here. It also lets me turn off everything attached with one switch when it's not in use. You're going to see a theme of me using older gear. This is a part of my music from the least gear ethos. The center of any studio is the computer. I'm running a vintage, for a computer, 2017 iMac. When it was new, it cost just over $1,700. Divide that by the five years of use for just $300 a year over the projected life use. Pretty cheap. I've kept it limping along by upping the RAM from 16 to 32 and now maxed out at 64. This helps make up for the slower processors. Even so, I'll probably have to budget for buying a new computer in the next year or two. I bought my audio interface when I started the channel in 2018. I chose an Audient ID44 because it had a reputation for the quality of the mic pre's, and it gave me four XLR inputs. Having the four channels lets me keep my live streaming mic connected all the time, and having another stereo pair available lets me connect either direct with a Line 6 modeling gear or direct outs from the Fender Tone Master Deluxes. The ID44 is still about 700 bucks, about half of what it would cost to buy a more software-driven unit, but plenty for me, and it sounds great. To reach the audio interface in the space, and to provide another step of gain staging between the amps and the audience, I added a little Yamaha MG10 mixer. The amps and the keyboards run to the mixer and then out to the mixer into the audience interface. I record my overhead audio in Logic, then sync it and edit everything in Final Cut Pro. The overhead mic is a Rode NTG3, about $300. Before I bought the shotgun mic, 
I just used an inexpensive Audio-Technica 2031. This is a mid-size condenser mic in a pencil configuration. It's small enough to easily hang over my head and point it at my chest. It's about a $70 microphone. For monitoring, I use a pair of M-Audio BX5As with the matching subwoofer. These have to be at least 15 years old now, and I'm so used to them that when I wanted to add another pair of speakers to fill out the room for when I'm playing piano, I searched online to find another pair. They have 5-inch woofers and they're great near-field monitors. Not very flattering, pretty flat. When I bought them originally, I was writing a lot of electronic music, and a lot of electronic music guys were using them. Also, I like the blue indicator lights. I have them on K&M stands to get them up away from the desk surface reflections. The stands weren't cheap, but they make a huge difference in the imaging. When I knew I was going to set up the office for live streaming, I bought a Sony ZV-E10 camera to leave permanently mounted for live streams and web meetings. I run the camera on a continuous power adapter. It runs into a CamLink USB interface in the back of the Mac. I bought two desktop booms to mount the camera and mic. They swing out of the way and are behind the monitor when not in use, which I find less distracting. Again, tidy. I have two Niwar 660 LED lights with shallow round softboxes on stand on each side of my desk to handle all the lighting. I use a traditional two-thirds left, one-third right lighting. This approach gives more depth than equally balanced lighting. There's a torchier lamp in the back corner of the room, and I run that for fill light when the sun is down. The big window faces east, and the ranch house has deep eaves, so after about 10 in the morning, I get nice diffused light on the left side. The challenge with natural light, of course, is that Mother Nature operates on her own schedule clouds moving over, and the bane of trying to get natural light to work for a longer shoot. So one of the first things I did at the house was to have room darkening blinds installed. This lets me control the lighting. As a bonus, the accordion style blinds do a great job of diffusing sound. Speaking of which, I put a 5x7 carpet with a thick pad on the floor and a bookshelf in the corner to further help break things up in the parallel walls. Bookshelves are great for knocking down standing waves in a room, and books always warm up a room for me. The space is dead enough for a live stream, and as the inputs on the amp and keyboards are in the box, the room is great for capturing ideas and recording. I've partnered with Truefire as a sponsor because I believe in what they do, using world-class teachers to create online lessons. I've used them for years, and my playing always improves when I start a new course. Whether you're a beginner, intermediate, or advanced level player, Truefire has something to enhance and inspire your playing. Hi, I'm Vincent DiPasquale with Fader Pro. And I'm very happy to be partnering with Truefire and Universal Audio to bring you a series of videos to help you get started in home recording. Get 25% off courses using the promo code 5Watt25, or like I have for many years, sign up for the All Access Pass to use the entire Truefire catalog. Learn, practice, and play with Truefire. I'd like to thank Truefire for our ongoing partnership and for sponsoring this video. And that brings us to the guitars. How many is enough for me running the channel now? You might remember in the summer of 2021, I sold 11 electric guitars. I'm left with my three main Strandberg Salins, a Bowden NX that Strandberg sent me to check out, and the Gibson ES390. I have the Salins set up with three different pickup configurations. A Mojo Tone Quiet Coil Broadcaster pickup in the Esquire Style Classic, Freyland Humbuckers in the Semi Hollow Deluxe, and K-Line Strat Style pickups in the John Cordy Tribute Iced Blue Metallic Classic. This is my version of a Tele, Les Paul, and a Strat. I like that I can get such very different tones from three guitars that feel so much alike. I feel that my playing really benefits from that shared platform. I ended up liking the Bowden NX much more than I expected to, preferring the sail and shape. But when I'm playing it, that's not an issue, and it sounds great. Whenever I open the case for my Gibson ES390, I always hear the sound of John Cleese from Monty Python saying, And now for something completely different. The guitar is a downsized 335 shape, but is fully hollow. The smaller size body really fits me, as I'm really not a very big person. I have flat wand strings on it, and so the traditional jazz tones and even Epiphone Casino Beatles-y tones are fully on tap. They only built these from 2012 to 2014, so I'll be holding on to this one. I own three acoustic guitars as well. There's a Taylor GS Mini Special in Alcoa that fills the bill for both something different for recording and as a campfire guitar. Since they made me study classical guitar in college, I've always held on to a nylon string. Currently, that's a Cordoba Pro Negra, spruce top, rosewood back and sides. It's part of their Fusion series, has a slightly narrower neck and a slightly radius fingerboard, so it's more comfortable for me as I have smaller hands and I'm mostly an electric player anyway. Finally, my forever acoustic guitar is a Circle Strings custom OM style built by Adam Buckwald in Burlington, Vermont in 2015. 
The back and sides are black walnut from the farm where I grew up. The flame maple stripe and binding was cut and aged in Vermont by a friend who's a high-end furniture builder who also milled the walnut for me. It has a 24 and 3 quarter inch Gibson acoustic scale and it sounds like it. Warmer, full, but not boomy like a dreadnought can be. This guitar will stay in the family for generations to come. There's also a Breedlove mandolin in the closet for when I feel a need to play some Irish music. This is from when they were still making handmade instruments in Oregon. There's a humidity control on the central heat and AC unit that lets me keep it where I need to be able to leave the guitars out on stands, reminding me to play every day. I just bought a full-size weighted key Native Instruments S88 controller for the new room. I also have a Dave Smith Pro 2 Monosynth. You can see it behind me when I do live streams. And finally, I have my trusty old late 80s Roland U20 sample playback synth, which for many years was my only keyboard. The design of this room was aimed to maximize ease of playing and recording. I want to remove barriers of setting up and plugging things in before being able to get recording. Summer of 2021 also saw me selling off 12 amplifiers. I made a video about what I kept, so I'll just very briefly touch on them here. I kept my FYD Desktop Champ, a Fender 60 style 5 water that Dan Lurie designed for me. I have a pair of Fender Tone Master Deluxes currently with Neo Cream back speakers and the special edition firmware installed. I also have one of the newer Fender Vibrachamp reverb amps that's often in the corner of the living room as a practice amp. The Tone Masters are unique in their lightweight, flexibility, and volume control with the quote unquote wattage switch in the back. But to be honest, I much prefer working with smaller and playing amps from smaller companies. I think that much of the innovation in the amp world is coming from these sorts of companies today. My two favorite companies are Victory and Rev. Currently, my largest tube amp is the Victory VC35 Copper. I can dial the VC35 to make it sound like everything from an AC30 to a Marshall JTM to a 60s Fender. It runs at a selectable 11 watts or 35 watts, which is very cool, and the 1x12 Celestian Gold Cab sounds glorious. I could use it on a singer-songwriter Americana gig at 11 watts, or as I usually do around the house, or at an outdoor winery jazz gig at the full 35 watts. Last year I also purged the pedals that I had piled up since the previous purge in 2018. I kept a handful of drive pedals, because I like to run a drive pedal in front of the Line 6 gear. It feels more responsive to me. Brad Jetter and Dave Barber theorized that this might be due to a better impedance matching with my specific guitars, or that it's my imagination. <laughs> they run alongside either an HX effects or an HX stomp. My buddy and fellow YouTuber John Cordy continues to prove that you can get most everything you need from the Line 6 stuff. To film the full-length videos, I currently have a setup in the second bedroom. It might seem like an incredible luxury to leave this set up, but it saves me about three hours every time I need to fill a full-length video. I'm also not wrestling with lighting and focus right before I sit down to film a script, and that's a real advantage. In here, I use a 2021 M1 MacBook Air with 16 gigabytes of RAM, running Logic to capture the overhead. Everyone has always commented on the high-quality audio in my videos. Well, the interesting thing is that I've used that Audio-Technica 2031 medium condenser mic since I began making videos back in 2018. I hang it overhead, just out of frame, and point it down at my chest to get a little off-axis bass response. That now runs into an Art Tube MP Mic Pre, and then that runs into a Focusrite Scarlett single-channel interface. I suspect that the Tube MP warms up the signal, but that, again, might be my imagination. I record directly to an SD card and a hyperdrive USB expansion unit. When I'm done recording, I pull the card from the audio and I pull the card from the camera and go next door to the iMac for editing. This also functions as a backup for my main interface and computer. If the audio or iMac fail, I can keep making videos or running live streams with the backup gear. Both the Tube MP and Focusrite were pretty inexpensive at about $100 each, and you can see the quality of audio I can get with these pieces. My main camera for a couple of years now has been a Lumix S5. I'm very happy with the autofocus and sharp 4K video I get from this camera. A lot of you have commented over time about how incredibly sharp the video is. The key here is having clear lighting on the subject so that the camera knows where to focus. You simply need to feed a good camera a lot of good light to get these kind of results. I actually use a pretty elaborate lighting setup because I wear glasses, reflections are a constant problem. I have an Amaram 100X LED with an Aperture Light Dome SE softbox as my main key light. This is one of the new LED driven lights and it ran me about 350 as opposed to a full on 120D that would have been 750 and it would have been total overkill for me. I have, then have another Neewar 660 with the shallow round softbox as a fill light. 
I have both of these lights as close to me as possible to maximize the softness of the light and to fill in around behind my glasses. There's a small LED light below the camera that fills in some of the light under my chin. I got this idea from the lighting setup that they use at TrueFire, actually. And just behind me, at shoulder height, is another small LED pointed at the wall. This light is set very low to create a soft halo of light behind me on the wall, which helps to visually separate me from that space, giving the whole shot some more depth. That leaves me with a small mood lighting coming from the now iconic license plate sign with the little LEDs all around. I have one of these that travels back and forth for filming. A light source in the background emphasizes the soft focus to the background and helps to provide depth to the shot. Again, this separates the subject from the background and is key to keeping focus on the speaker. There's a closet full of tubs with cables, ties, velcro, power cords, chargers, etc. And these are critical but are usually collected over time. I use storage tubs to keep all this stuff relatively organized. I want to say here that you can run a successful channel with a whole lot less and still get great results. My buddy Zach Childs uses his iPhone to record his video, and he uses his wife's iPhone to record his audio via a lavalier mic. His videos look and sound great, proving that content over tech wins every time. And true to my tagline, I'm often looking at my setup trying to think of ways to reduce the amount of stuff I have to run it all. This extends not just to cameras and lights, but all the ways that I do the accounting and administration for the channel. I'm always looking to minimize the time spent on administration to maximize the time for creation. I hope some of what I've covered here will help you do that as well. I'll be doing a live stream with a special guest to follow up on this video, so check that out as well. I need to thank everyone, YouTubers and musicians, that have posted their studio tours over the years. I love these things, sort of like everyday carry videos. I'm fascinated by what people use each day to make things happen. In particular, I need to thank Paul Davids, Rhett Schull, and Rick Beato for their guidance as I've built out my simple setup. I need to thank my script editor, Perry McManus. He's always there to help tidy things up. I'd like to thank everyone that stopped by the store to grab a t-shirt, the Stomp preset pack, or a hoodie. You keep 5 Watt World running. And most importantly, I want to thank my friends of 5 Watt on Patreon. This is the gear community I've always dreamed of having, and I love the back and forth and messages that we enjoy on Patreon. Think about coming along for exclusive live streams and early access to videos. If you enjoyed this studio tour, hit the like button, and if you haven't subscribed yet, go ahead and hit that too. Thanks for staying with me until the end of the video. This is Keith Williams. Until next time, thanks for being a part of the 5 Watt world.